but I will also try to, I will try to keep it short as well because the Zoom seminars are always a bit, uh, I don't know, complicated. But yeah, as Anna said, like I used to work in, in the Biology Center in Czech Republic. I did my PhD there with Simon. Then I did a bit of a postdoc with Robert on uh, plant pollinator interactions. And then I kind of, I'm still working in plant pollination interactions with Ernesto Bonadies there in, in Czeske Bujovice. He's dealing with all the pollinator work. But at the same time, I kind of, because I don't know much about insects, I started working with Eves and trying to get a bit of a hang of things. And so I got involved in this uh, metabarcoding project of bulk samples. Originally, this was a, a, a project planned by Greg, more or less, and Benita. And Peter Blasek was also there in, in Panama when they did this first, uh, not the first, but the second attempt at metabarcoding bulk samples. And so I kind of inherited this data, and it's a bit what I've been working on for the last uh, two years, I think. Uh, I, it sounds like a long time, but it was like, I think it's a lot of work, but we'll go on with it. So it's DNA metabarcoding of bulk arthropod samples in Barro Colorado Island as a cost-efficient monitoring protocol. So many of you know or have seen the headlines. It's quite popular now to talk about this insect Armageddon and the incredible decline of insects. I particularly like this cover from the New York Times from 2018, I think, which is uh, the insect apocalypse is here. Like, it's very dramatic. And of course, like insects are probably at the base of ecosystem functioning. They have like really tight host plant associations, parasitism, herbivory. They work as the basic diet of everything coming above plants. So the apocalypse would be a very dramatic thing indeed. But these studies have had like a lot of pushback because it's really hard to assess the true uh, insect decline. And this is mainly because I thought I didn't know anything, but it turns out that most of us don't know anything. So I've been working in Barro Corrado Island, which is supposed to be one of the best studied tropical forests in the world. I know there's people from PNG listening right now and they will think, well, wow, if they are the best studied, then in Papua, we're still a bit, uh, we have a long way to go basically. But Barro Corrado is this like really nice tropical island. You can see here's the facilities of the Smithsonian. The island used to be a mountain that was, uh, well, yeah, the, the island was created when they flooded the, the Panama Canal. And so it used to be this big mountain. And now it's a very, the remaining island has been a protected area for about 100 years now. It will be the 100 year anniversary, anniversary of BCI next year. And within this uh, island, you have this forest geo plot, 50 hectare permanent plot as they do in Wanang. And here is where Eve has been working for the last 15 years. And if you know, Eve has this uh, long going arthropod monitoring protocol. Here's Eve working with a few of, the, well, with all of the project assistants. There's Greg as well. And the arthropod monitoring project have been going for 14 years. They basically do several different uh, arthropod catching techniques, malaise traps, pollard walks, uh, light trapping, beating, winkler, malaise, etc., to try and get an idea of the of what insects are on the island. Uh, and they have like focal groups, so they go from termites, art, uh, termites, uh, ants, uh, springtails. Then you have butterflies, some groups of moths. Anyway, focal species that they are pretty confident on their identification, and it's what they've been using for this monitor monitoring protocol for 14 years. More recently, now that they have been collecting all this demograph demographic data of insects, they are starting to publish like these long-term series, which are becoming super popular with the idea of this insect decline. So this is just two examples. One is very recent from Nick and Greg, both from BC as well. Well, not Nick, not anymore, but uh, more winners than losers. And basically they focus only on this Erebide, this uh, Arctine tiger moths. And it's just a graph to show that the population trends are not the same for every uh, species. Some are actually increasing, so while some decrease, it seems that some are taking advantage 
of what we think the only factor is, which is uh, climate change. This can be a bit uh, controversial, but basically you can see some, not in this figure exactly, but you can see some trends when there is El Nino or El Nina events that some populations crash, but also some populations increase. So to say like this big broad stroke of arthropod decline is a bit tricky. On the right, this is a Euglossin bees, where the trend is even less clear. I think, I don't know if you can see the, because the little camera panel is on the way, but the rightmost graph, you can see Euglossa imperialis. That one, there seems to be a small decrease in population. Like in, this is just raw number of bees that they have surveyed every year. So these were population trends, but at the same time, the uh, Eves and his team have been also very diligent, I think, in creating a barcode library of almost every species they catch. I say almost because it's not easy. They have over half a million collections, about 670,000 entries as of last year. They do this 330 annual samples in the wet season and in the dry season, so it's about 150 for each year. But then they try to barcode every species that they are not very confident in their ID, first of all. And second of all, they try to have a very good representation of everything that has been collected. This is tightly connected with the barcode of life systems, this bold database, which is like a worldwide repository for CO1 sequences for arthropods. They also have for plants and, and fungi and stuff, but their biggest database is uh, CO1. So the Forest Geo Arthropod Monitoring Protocol has already contributed over 11,000 sequences for about 2,500 2, focal species. This number is no longer correct. It's about 2,850. But this just say that they have contributed a large amount of barcodes. So after all these years of collecting demographic data and having like an idea of population trends and so on, you can imagine the amount of time it consumes from collecting the sample to sorting the sample and then manually trying to identify, even if it's just a reduced number of focal groups, to actually do this work is, is hellish. And he, Eve has about, uh, I think it's five full-time assistants that are doing the field work, but also sorting through the, the collections. So in 2019, I think they started trying to see how good metabar coding would actually be for this kind of work. Metabar coding has been hailed like this uh, amazing technique that will really solve our taxonomic impediment where you don't, you can be someone like me that doesn't know much about insects and still be able to have a nice biodiversity assessment or at least know more or less what is present in your, in your captures without having to either be really specialized or then start sending different groups to people all over the world, which also don't have time. There was a nice article published, I think, 2022, which is like a, a taxonomist at an extinction risk, because it's true, like more and more there are fewer taxonomists, or especially for like really specialized groups, there's like three left in the world and some are close to retiring or should have retired already. But anyway, so Eve had this small, small pilot study, I think it's not small, but it's a pilot study, for metabar coding uh, soil fauna. So this plot here is just the 50 hectare plot. These are the different trails that they have been using for the regular surveys that they, use, that they do. Each of the red lines is just an area of what they're considering their subplots. And for this study, they collected the top soil layer with Winkler traps uh, 10 centimeters apart. And one was going for metabar coding and one was going for manual identification. In this, case, in this case, they only did ants, termites, and springtails, colembola. And this is when I got involved a bit with the metabar coding, just for the data analysis. And this picture here in the right, on, just to show in purple, is species identified by uh, manually sorting them or in orange is species identified through metabar coding, okay? This is a really reduced sample of what they actually got because they wanted only to include ants, termites, and springtails, and also only the common species. 
the idea was to detect false positives and to see, because we have a pretty good idea in Barro Colorado of what at least ants and termites are there. We thought, well, maybe they should at least match. And they do match. These trees, you will see them a lot because it's basically everything I will be showing today. So get used to them. The sizes of the circle indicate the number of times that taxonomic rank was registered in the data set. Okay. So obviously, for Formicide, because they're all ants, then the Formicide circle is larger. But then, okay, so Anopsis was very present in uh, traditional, let's call them traditional manually sorted samples. But still, you see that some of these, they have no name, it's just a barcode index number. They don't have a species are not described yet. You have uh, some that were detected only by metabarcoding. In gray, it means that they're collected more or less at the same rate in both uh, methods. So as you can see here, was metabarcoding was a lot better at capturing diversity of termites, but of ants and springtails is a bit uh, tricky. I think the case for springtails can be also the fact that they're not so well studied. Like, I think there's one group that specializes in tropical springtails, which is in Mexico, and so they have to send all the samples to them. So maybe for springtails, the situation is not the same as ants and termites, but anyway. So this is where Greg got the idea, I believe. And then, because he wanted to see like a bigger picture kind of thing, they went for light trapping as a method for bulk sample collection. Instead of getting topsoils, they went around the same trails and put 10 light traps on new moon nights. And each site has one replicate. So it's two non-consecutive nights of light trapping in the wet season and in the dry season. So this gave us 40 samples total, 20 per season. And the exact same protocol was repeated, but the first 40 samples were classified through metabarcoding. And here you can see more or less the work that went into it. They had to seed out the, this is just methodological details. I'm sorry, it's not too important. But they seeded out the used ethanol, replaced it with new ethanol, and then they basically blended these samples with a hand blender. And then you got this soup. And this is the soup that we sent to Canada for DNA extraction and sequencing. And the other samples they kept, and they were manually sorting through them and tried to identify the focal groups of forest geome. Then I came in, basically, I was not involved in this field work, but it was done 2019 first, I was still in Czech Republic, and then 2021, because obviously 2020 was a dark year for most. So we sent these samples to Canada, uh, the, the center of uh, biodiversity and monitoring, I can't remember the name of the wealth department that does the sequencing, but basically we send them the extracts, this soup, then they do four replicates, do the DNA extraction and sequencing with just like standard procedures. We sequence CO1 using these two primers, which have been proven to be very generalist. They were designed for Lepidoptera, but they're actually quite effective at capturing most other insects. I'm not gonna say all, because I think that's impossible. This is just details of the parameters, but we have like 22 million reads for both wet and dry season. We trim for quality control, remove primers, et cetera. And then we use this platform called Embrave, which is part of the bold database. And a lot of people don't like it. So this is a disclaimer because most people want to do their metabar coding by hand. And Embrave is a lot of a click and point and you can choose the parameters from a drop down menu. I personally like it, but there seem to be some people that don't like it too much because you don't have such control on the data that you get out. Specifically, Embrave only uses bold library, okay? So you can only match your OTU clusters, these operational taxonomic units. You can only uh, classify them through what's already available in bold, which for us was excellent because Eve has been working on this bold library for Barro Corrado insects, arthropods. Uh, so you can, you, you get all your OTUs, these clusters of OTUs, and then you can just classify them through the existing databases and you can do it in order. 
So we first use these Barocorado arthropods, then this control insecta, which is all insects in the bold library, and then a few like control libraries just to remove contaminants. And after all this quality control and filtering, etc., which was, I think, quite uh, stringent, like we, we were very tight because I wanted each cluster of OTU to be at least 98% identical to a bin, a barcode index number, like one of these reference bins. Some people use 3%. I chose 2% because I was, at least I am still more interested to see what is actually there than to recover every single possible OTU. You will see a bit more of this in the later on. But anyway, just from this metabar coding, we were able to get 4,600 uh, individual bins. This not should be should not be out, should be OTU. But the word, I think, uh, corrects that word automatically. Anyway, again, these heat trees, this now includes every single thing we captured in the meta recording uh, in, in the light traps. So you can see, of course, okay, everything's animalia, arthropoda. We have no weird things going on. And again, the circles indicate the number of reads in this case that belong to that taxonomic rank. So you can see Lepidoptera, it's probably the best. Uh, well, light traps were designed with nocturnal moths in mind. So it's, they're bound to collect the largest number. But we also have a nice amount of Coleoptera, Diptera, and Emiptera. I think these were the four main groups. Then we have uh, even Optera in here, and then just a mess. But I will filter through it as we go along. You can see that there is in blue, and there is a few branches and, and nodes in orange. This is de detecting the differences between wet season in blue and dry season in orange. Uh, if we look at the right panel, let me just move these cameras again. You can see what we did just like standard rarefaction curves to see that we're really getting enough of the diversity based on our sampling. You can see that for the wet season was pretty good. For the dry season, we don't get that, like the curve doesn't quite flat out as much. But it seems that around 20,000 reads per sample is okay to get the uh, enough representation of diversity. Uh, if we look at just the observed diversity, it is significantly different. We had a lot more species in the wet season than we do in the dry. And the Shannon diversity in index is uh, showing the same significant difference between seasons. Simpson index did not, but I think this is because it considers uh, only the common species rather than, than the rare ones. And if you look down here, this is like more or less the distribution of reads. Most metabarcoding studies, they really fall short on this promise of being able to do all these biodiversity estimates. And most of them just end in order. And they will show you a pie chart of what percentage of what order was. This more or less shows the same, but I will try to refine this information as we go along. But I think there is one really cool thing here. I mean, you can see, of course, in blue, Lepidoptera in, in light greenish bluish is uh, Diptera, which were the most common. Yellow is uh, Coleoptera. And then you have this one site, which is completely dominated by Imenoptera. So here I want to see, okay, what the hell is this about? 75% of reads of that sample belong to this guy here, which is uh, Apoica palens. And you can even see it in this sample. Yeah, these yellow abdomens, they all belong to these species. So that's why there's like 75% of reads belonging to that animal. Uh, apparently, this uh, night nocturnal wasp, which has like this big swarming behavior. So obviously, they went all, I mean, probably the light trap was placed near the, near the nest or something, so they went all crazy. And this is just a principal coordinate analysis showing, again, that we have a very nice separation between seasons. And these are just like notable things or barcode index numbers that drive this difference. Uh, I tried to refine the data a little bit more. And I think these look cool. I've been looking at them for a long time. And the more I look at them, the more details I pick out. Lepidoptera, I will not focus too much in it, except that you can really see that for Crambide and for uh, Geometride, there are some branches that are really like more present in the dry season. But 
as in most of the tropics, the wet season is like the peak of insect abundance. But here, for example, in Imenoptera, like there is this one little branch. In gray, it means that there's no significant difference, okay? It means that they occur at the same frequency in both seasons. But here in Imenoptera, there is one branch. This is a Megalopta. I only know this because I've been looking at this for a long time. And Megalopta is also one of the pollinators from Ernesto's work. Uh, I was with him in the field a few times in the wet, in the dry season, and we were only finding Amuena uh, Megalopta genialis. And then when I saw this data, I was like, well, okay, no wonder we didn't find Megalopta uh, Amuena in the dry season because it's not as frequent. So you can really, I mean, the level of resolution that we have, taxonomic resolution, because we only use bins, I think it's pretty neat. Like you can really start to pick out some of these fine resolution, fine details of some individual species rather than telling you, oh yes, we collected, I don't know, 2000 Lepidoptera. Well, that's great, but what about it? And another neat thing I think is that for any monitoring protocol, you need to be able to find uh, seasonal differences over the year. And here with only 20 light traps in the dry season and 20 light traps in the wet season, we're able to, to recover a lot of these uh, yearly dynamics on, on insect diversity. And it's all derived from a zoo, okay? Uh, as I say, we can refine a bit better the, the, the data. Oh, shoot, sorry. Uh, this is now just uh, showing you the main families that drive most of the seasonal difference for these three groups. I don't include any more figures of uh, Imenoptera and Emiptera, but if you want to know more details, you can ask me. Um, but one interesting thing is that I keep repeating this, we don't know anything. Butterflies, which are meant to be the best studied group, we recovered 1800 beans more or less. 9% of these beans were only identified to order. Like they just say it's a Lepidoptera. And in this case, I'm not included, including a lot of uh, barcoding um, efforts that have been done mostly in Costa Rica, where they just call uh, geometry the genus species unknown. As you can see, 77% are identified to genus, but many of these include that they just know the genus, yeah? And only 32% of these 1800 beans had a species name. And this is like a scientific binomial, yeah? Because there's many hundreds of species that are like SP1 Dan Jansen or SP17 Ivase. Like you can do this in bold. You can actually say, we, we don't know what species it is. This is the barcode. We're waiting for someone to describe it. But because the barcode is already linked to that individual, once it's described, you just change it. And then this, hopefully as time goes on and more people are doing meta barcoding, more people are eager on barcodes, this will be a bit uh, refined. We will get more species. And that's for Lepidoptera, the best studied group. If we look at flies, wow, only 5% have a species name. Uh, Coleoptera, 13%, uh, Imenoptera, 25%, and Emiptera, 20%. So for Barro Colorado, the best studied tropical forest in the world, wow, we have a long way to go. But anyway, here I only filter through to family. And we can already start seeing some differences. Like this is just relative read abundance. And then this uh, linear discriminant analysis showing where is this difference on the families or how strong is the pool of these families on different seasons. So you can see it every day is like incredibly common in the dry season. And this is really pushing the separation between wet and dry. And you can find some interesting things, I think. For example, in Diptera, Pulicidae, which is the family of mosquitoes. Well, it turns out it's more abundant in the dry season than in the wet, which is against all reason. What we think is that probably these traps were placed near water sources, probably, and that's why we see so much difference. But anyway, there is like a lot of little details that you can make a lot of guesses, but you still need to dig into the ecology of these groups to actually know how real is this difference. But then I wanted to compare as well to the ongoing, ongoing monitoring efforts of Forest Geo. 
it's all the same now, but in green, it's a uh, meta coding. In purple are these parallel samples, these samples that we did, uh, they sorted manually. Uh, again, I filter the meta coding data to only include focal groups because it's not fair to compare deep data with someone that is not collecting deep data. Flies are not part of um, forest geos focal groups. So this data set is filtered except for these two figures. These are filtered only to include focal groups. And as you can see, I mean, we detect a lot more with metabar coding, okay? This is obvious, this was expected, but we can see that it's not terrible for Lepidoptera, it's not terrible for Emiptera, well, Blatodea, it was actually better, I mean termites, it was actually better with the manual sorting than through metabar coding in this case, because if you remember, the soil meta metabar coding study found more termites through metabar coding than through manual sorting. So of course there are differences, but you can see again that they cluster quite clearly as different collection methods, but they still cluster as seasonal. So you can still see these seasonal differences between both uh, methods. Uh, and the overlap, this means like how many species were collected by both methods. I think it's quite, interesting like 385 out of the 600 i think uh, species that we found through uh, manual sorting now this is what they are sorting through so still to find 385 species is a i think an outstanding feat especially when you consider all these micro lepidoptera which are completely damaged their scales are destroyed imagine sometimes that beetles fall into the into the trap as well, and they don't die as fast as, as the rest of the insects. And as they try to escape, they basically destroy the sample. I mean, I don't know how many of you have worked with uh, light traps, but it's, it's a mess. It's interesting. But if we go again, filtering to the best studied groups, the situation is a lot better, I think, for manual sorting. Okay, they don't collect as many species okay but that was a given that was a fact that we expected but the overlap for geometry day it's much bigger there are fewer species that are this part is weird there's only a few species that are collected through manual sorting but not through metabar coding and i think this is the part where we have to be really careful i mean if steam has been working on this for 15 years and they're well more than 15 years there are very specialized people in identifying the diversity of Barro Colorado. And most of these issues where you have like more in metabar coding, uh, less in metabar coding than in manual samples, it's usually these like really hard groups to actually separate like Sameopus in, in, in Geometry Day. These are like genera that are like notoriously difficult. Yeah. These micro lepidoptera that are completely destroyed, then I think its mistakes are easier to be made. And then you have some groups that we have no idea what they are, like this uh, Fisagunie group. We only know the genera, but this is the biggest challenge in metabar coding is species nomenclature, okay? And this is a very nice example within Piralide that we have this Fisagunie group. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong, it doesn't matter. Where you only have the species name are SP1 if base, and these are all barcodes generated by if. But then you have this CRI BioLab, which also have all these uh, placeholder names. They're, they don't have a name. It's like BioLab 27, BioLab 422. And so these difficult groups are the ones that are driving most of these differences between manual sorting and metabar coding. The machine is harder to make a mistake because it's looking for identical uh, sequence rather than trying to find like descriptive characteristics for destroyed bugs. Yeah, this is just a table of most of the focal groups of of uh, Forest Geo. As you can see, almost all of them metabar coding outperforms manual sorting, except a few groups where we get a lot more species through manual sorting than through metabar coding. We still have to think a bit more about this, but 
it's possible also that because these were not done in consecutive nights, there is this like phenological variation within the forest that one day you can find a lot of species, the next day there is nothing, or different communities from one day to the next. So this is comparing 40 metabarcoding samples versus 40 parallel samples, okay? But I thought, well, no, let's do it with the 14 years of light trapping at BCI from Eve's team. So if we had 40 light trap nights, the Forest Geo has over the years collected 1,200 light trap nights. And I want to see, well, wow, how does this actually compare to only 40 light trap nights through metabar coding? Again, these two figures show the totality, like every single bin recovered by both methods, which is an unfair comparison because again, deep data is included, et cetera. But if we focus only on the forest geo groups, wow, the overlap is a lot better. There's still a long way to go, but it's not that much. Like it's only half of the diversity, almost 50% overlap, only from one season in one year. So you can imagine if you continue to do this work, through metabar coding, like I believe this circle will start encompassing the other one. And we will be able to then confidently say with a few light trapping nights that we have collected most, if not all, the focal group diversity of the island. Here is just like to show you how large the metabar coding difference is. But if you take, take the 40 light trap nights, well, they're all within what has been collected in Forest Geo, uh, and hopefully this will grow. Again, I'm just showing uh, Lepidoptera for, to exemplify this. In Geometry Day, we can see that now it's actually uh, Forest Geo samples that have the majority of, of diversity, but the overlap is amazing, I think. Uh, for Erebi Day, okay, we still collect a lot more, but this is mostly because for Erebi Day, if you remember at the beginning of the presentation, the forest geo focuses mostly on arctin, which used to be a family. Now it's a subfamily within Erebide. So of course there's all this diversity that forest geo was not uh, focused on. And again, if we look at the table, well, there are many more families now that traditional sampling outperforms metabar coding, but this took 1,200 nights of light trapping plus however many thousands of man-powered hours, man and woman, to sort through this data. While here, a person like me with very little knowledge of general biodiversity uh, can reach these uh, conclusions. There is a small caveat here because as I said in the beginning, there's about 2,800 uh, bins that have been contributed by Forest Geo to the BOLD database. And I showed here more than 4,000 bins and groups that are not studied by Forest Geo, deep data, and so on. So I am actually depending on this much larger barcoding effort to actually find these uh, bins. There is a huge ongoing effort in, in Costa Rica, in Guanacaste, by Dan Jansen, who has been like a very strong supporter of, of barcoding. And they have barcoded hundreds of thousands of individuals. And a lot of the bins that I'm getting are from there. And the same for global malaise programs and all these large international efforts for metabar coding. Uh, I hope that's clear. So next, well, now this is part of a very big project, which is funded by Senacid, which is the GACHAR equivalent of Panama, more or less, is the Secretary of Science and Technology. And now we want to do this at a much larger scale, but including a lot more different uh, sampling protocols. We have Winkler traps, we have Berles, we have pitfall traps, we have Malays. I couldn't find a picture of me doing beating, but I think we look similar enough. Uh, and then the idea now, as I said, we still need to dig, we have this inventory, but we need to dig into the ecology of these insects and why are these differences. So we're also doing this LIDAR of BCI, this uh, light infrared, uh, some radar, I can't remember the, the name. But anyway, you are able to map the forest and the forest layers. And we 
beyond just seasonal differences, we want to look at location differences. And with this mapping of the forest, you can actually start to calculate how much woody debris there is larger than X amount, how high is the canopy, how much light is penetrating, etc. And then we will hopefully be able to detect these really fine scale differences between sampling localities and sampling seasons. Uh, and of course, we need a lot more barcodes. I mean, if money was unlimited, I think barcoding every single individual that we collect would be ideal. And then that will free up time for people that are manually sorting through these uh, samples. Uh, and I said it would be a bit uh, shorter than you used to, but I think it's still within the time. So thanks again to all the collaborators. Uh, thanks a lot to you for listening. And, and again, sorry for the lack of pizza. And if there is any questions, please, uh, I am open. Thank you, Daniel, for a very exciting, uh, exciting view uh, of two methods and, and the comparison. So anyone, if you have a question, please ask Daniel. I will stop sharing the screen so I can see the things. OK, maybe I can start. Uh, hi, Daniel. Uh, so I was actually expecting for the families like uh, pyralids, crumbids, geometrids. I was actually expecting um, uh, to have fewer um, new species uh, from barcoding than, than you have shown. Uh, mm -hmm. Considering the number of light trapping nights, uh, you know, done or, uh, over the years, what's your impression or your comment on this? But it's it's a bit complicated, I think, because you mean from the ones collected by Forest Geo? Yes. That, that, that there would be fewer. I expected that uh, Forest Geo would have done would have basically everything. From the suitable families like like pyralids, uh, crumbids, geometrids, which are you know really targeted uh, in the surveys, and uh, so I would expect barcoding simply confirming the already known species in in a great majority, which was partly mm -hmm. the case, but but to much less extent than I than I had expected. Yes, for, for me it was also a surprise because these were the best studied groups. I keep using quotations because. It seems that we're not really that prepared. The, the biggest issue with these, like especially the ones where we have more barcodes in geometry, many of them are these groups that are probably full of cryptic species. There is one famous study by Dan Jansen, which is 10 species in one. And it's a single species that has 10 different barcodes. Well, it's 10 different species if you consider the barcode as a single species. So I think we have a lot more of these situations that we expected. And then is the entire debate a bit of whether we consider a barcode index number a species or not. And this is an entire different debate that I am not totally prepared to get into. But this would be one part of the of the answer, I think. And the other one, I really think is just a, I don't want to say human error because this is really specialized knowledge. But there are probably some, well, there are certainly some species that still need very specialized knowledge of what are the characters that actually separate between these species. And I think over the years, you're just used to seeing them all the time. So we stop looking for those differences. That would be the second part. And the third is Eve has been trying still to group them as morpho species and sequence them. But many of the sequencing fails, and we don't get a proper sequence for those subgroups. So I think this could be the, I mean, at least explain it partly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Mm -mm. Okay, anyone else? I think it was so clear. <laughs> yeah. All right. Then if you have no more questions, we can finish the, the seminar. 
and I will send you the link to to share the the, the video, the recording. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank it's you. To see your names in Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See you, Daniel. And yeah. Bye. Ciao. Thank you. Bye bye.